it's really an honor and a privilege for me and for all of us to welcome back actually David Rubenstein and Bob Barnett. We've had them here a couple times and it's been nothing but a, a brilliant evening. Um, and thank you both for being with us to talk about David's newest book, The American Experiment, Dialogues on a Dream. And Bob will uh, explain to you, I'll sort of let him uh, not, not spoil his thunder here by talking about where this book will go on the bestseller list in the next week. So um, I, I was I skimmed through this book, uh, bopping around in different pages, but I was struck by what Dor Doris Kearns Goodwin said. And she said, at this turbulent moment in our nation's history, this captivating dialogue about the meaning of democracy and the American dream provides much needed inspiration and hope. And what a terrific book. And it truly is. And it is, you know, perfect for this moment in time. And, and especially, I think, perfect, as I've, I've noted, for sort of holiday, uh, holiday giving, reading and, and, and gift giving, because it's a real treasure. So David, welcome. Uh, David is a New York Times bestselling author. He's the co-founder and co-executive chairman of the Carlisle Group, chairman of the boards of trustees of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Poor Performing Arts and the Council on Foreign Relations. And he's also host of the David Rubenstein Show on Bloomberg TV and PBS. So David and Bob, which you'll see very soon, are longtime friends, and that'll come through in their conversation tonight and, and some of the bantering back and forth, which is really quite charming. Um, it's an absolute delight for me to welcome back Bob Barnett. Um, he uh, launched, Bob may not remember this, he launched our virtual events about a year and a half in May of, where were we, 2020, when he interviewed Madeleine Albright. So, uh, you know, here we are today and we're still going strong and we still have Bob. So thank you so much. Bob's one of the premier authors representatives in the world with an amazing client list, raising, uh, ranging from Presidents Obama, Clinton and Bush to First Ladies Michelle Obama, Hillary Clinton and Laura Bush to Barbara Streisand, the Prince of Wales and James Patterson and the list goes on and on. But most importantly to me, uh, Bob and his family are dear friends and loyal customers of Bookhampton. So again, welcome to both of you. And I will turn it over now to Bob. We'll be in conversation with David. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, it's always great to be with you and Bookhampton, and RJ Julia, and especially with my friend David. Uh, David and I go all the way back to law school. God help us. And um, I was he was voted most likely to become a billionaire. And I was voted most likely to become a poor country lawyer. And we both succeeded. So we're happy people. Uh, David probably doesn't remember, but I was instrumental in getting him one of his first jobs with Birch Buy. I gave him a glowing recommendation, which I sh I'm sure had no impact but it made me feel good. And I've been taking credit for his success ever since. Uh, David has authored several books, which I've been honored to work on with him. This latest one, The American Experiment, which I hope you all have bought or will buy, will premiere on the New York Times hardcover bestseller list this Sunday at number eight. And it will be number two on the Wall Street Journal hardcover nonfiction list. And it will be number two on the Publishers Weekly hardcover nonfiction list. That's quite an accomplishment for a substantive book of nonfiction. Uh, the book is a compilation of some amazing interviews. I, I've read them all, obviously. And there's some people who I thought I knew but I didn't because these interviews by David's skillful interviewing brings out things that don't always come out. And there are several people who I never heard of who gave amazing, insightful interviews. And the book is about, as the uh, title says, The American Experiment, what it means to be an American, if you will. And David, I'd like to start by quoting from uh, your great uh, editor, Stuart Roberts at Simon & Schuster, who we both uh, have great respect for. And he said in his introduction that this book helps you, quote, 
better understand the defining American genes, G-E-N-E-S. Tell me what the American genes are, David. Thank you very much, Bob, for the kind introduction. And as everybody probably knows, Bob was a superior law school student, top of his class, Supreme Court clerk for Justice Wizard White, and uh, a great lawyer for many, many years and has been my friend for more than 40 years. And Carolyn, thank you very much for um, keeping book selling alive in the Hamptons. I spent the entire summer in the Hamptons and I love the bookstores that are there, particularly yours. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, let me just to tell you what I mean by genes. Um, America is a bit of an experiment, as all of you probably know. We were a country created out of whole cloth. It was the wish of the founding fathers to create a representative democracy. And over the 230 years since this country has been in existence, we've had our ups and downs and we've had our stress tests. We've had our challenges for sure. Uh, and we have not quite lived up to the rhetoric of the founding fathers, which is to say all men are created equal and we have you know, a perfect union. We're not quite there yet, but we've made more progress than anybody might have thought 230 years ago. The reason I think we've made this progress is that I analogize it to the genes of a body. Each of you have genes in your body, obviously from your mother and father from, and your forebears. Um, you have millions of genes. Um, the country has thousands of genes, let's say, but I can focus on 13 of them. 13 things that I think make Americans distinctive from people in any other country. So they would be the right to the to belief in equality, the right to belief in diversity, the belief in the separation of powers, the belief in the rule of law, the belief in the peaceful transfer of power and not having military takeovers, the belief in the American dream, and, and so forth. And these genes have combined over the 230 years to give us a very unique country. Now, every country has its own genes. I think ours are the ones that have produced this, this incredible democracy. But we have something I will talk about in a moment as well, which is the democracies had a number of stress tests. The most obvious was the Civil War. Well, we've had two very serious stress tests recently. One was COVID and the other was the events of the election and the post-election. But our genes got us through that, in my view. If we didn't believe in the rule of law, we didn't believe in, in uh, the importance of separation of powers and so forth, we might not have gotten through this most recent uh, period of time post-election. Bob? David, um, you have in this book, Madeleine Albright, Ken Burns, um, John Meacham, Walter Isaacson, David McCullough, Billie Jean King, Rita Moreno, amazing people. But you dedicate the book to the public servants who protect our democracy. Tell us why you made that dedication. Well, the stress test that we had after the election was something that we really, um, we got through it, uh, but let's suppose certain things had happened differently. There were 65 lawsuits filed against uh, uh, the election and 65 times they were thrown out. But suppose the judges were more political than they were. Suppose uh, some of the election officials who were Republican were more political than they should have been. Uh, this is, things could have gone turned out differently. As we all know, if Mike Pence had said, I can't certify these results, um, it could have been a different outcome, particularly because the House of Representatives often is under our Constitution, is given the authority to decide presidential elections if the Senate can't really decide it. And had it gone to the House, the Republicans would have been in control because it, the House votes by the number of, uh, of state delegations. Each state delegation gets one vote, and there are more Republican delegations than there are Democratic delegations. So it could have gone differently. But I think the, the reason I dedicated to the to the public servants is that the public servants really did an incredible job of upholding the law, in my view. And I should just say, uh, with respect to judges, and Bob, you know this very well, the judges in our country, particularly the federal judges, it's an incredibly difficult job they have and for which they get compensated very, very modestly. They, they get hardly any compensation. It's a miracle that we don't have corruption in our federal judiciary system when you consider the fact that judges are paid much less than first-year associates at Bob's law firm. There is no uh, untruth about that. Um, in the introduction, David, following up on what you said, uh, and I recommend the introduction to everyone because it's thoughtful and personal from David. And you make a point there that follows up on what you just said, and I'd like you to expand on that. Uh, what is surprising that 
So many Republicans officials were willing to accept the fraud charges when there was no evidence at all. None who supported those claims apparently felt that their own elections held at the same time were invalidated by the fraud. Explain. Yes, it is iron, ironic that in the House of Representatives, for example, you had more than 100 Republican members saying that the election was fraudulently uh, uh, handled, but not one of them thought that their own election, uh, presumably by the same voters, ha had any fraud involved with it. So it is strange how you can have fraud only in a presidential election, but no fraud in the congressional elections. Um, but obviously that speaks for itself. Uh, what, what happened in the House and the Senate, I think, is really sad. That's uh, a sad commentary. Everybody in the House and everybody in the Senate, when you talk to those members privately, they know what was going on. But they were definitely afraid of Donald Trump. And they were definitely afraid of being on the wrong side of Donald Trump. And that's what really happened. Uh, fortunately, our federal judges did the right thing and also the state election officials. So we have a lot to be thankful for there. The stress test that we went through in COVID is also very significant. And I think that's another thing that the country survived in part because we, we had some pretty talented people in some parts of the government working to get the vaccine done. Most vaccines take four to seven years. We got this done in 11 months, and that is a miracle. David, you've, um, you worked on the Hill. You, uh, you and I worked together on the 23rd floor of the Colony Square office building in Atlanta and the Carter campaign. You went on to as I remember, and you've seen and been deeply involved in our government uh, at all levels for years. And again, in the introduction, you note, and you and I've talked about this many times, that a large number of Americans recognized that the country's historic core values are simply not shared by all Americans. And thus many Americans recognize that more work must be done to heal the divisions in the country if we are to ensure that our efforts to build a more perfect union can once again be a beacon for democracy. From your perch, your experience, your deep understanding of America and its constitution and its office holders, what can be done? Well, obviously if I had the answer, I would have been in Iowa and New Hampshire uh, uh, running for office. Uh, there's no easy answer, of course, but Bob, when you and I worked in the Senate in the 1970s, you for uh, Water Mondale and, and I for Birch Bay, there was bipartisan legislation. And Republicans and Democrats were considered people good legislators that they could work with the opposite party. Today, we have a situation where not only are you not supposed to work with people from the opposite party, you're not even supposed to see them, socialize with them, or talk with them. It's a sad situation. I think there are three factors that have led to this. One, uh, we have an incredible lust for money in politics. Um, members of Congress raise more money than they really need. Why do they do that? Because the more money they raise, the more money they can have to give to other members of Congress so that might give them some favors. Secondly, the more money they have, the more they can scare away opponents from running against them. And third, and this is very important too, if you, you have money left over when you leave politics or you're defeated, you can keep that money. Now, you can't use it for personal expenses, but you can use it for lots of political purposes. So members raise way too much money, and it's really uh, sad because when you're raising large sums, you have to give people things that they may not, they shouldn't really get in some cases. Secondly is this, the social media and internet is wonderful. It does a lot of great things for society, but it also, I think has driven the Democrats to the far to the left and Republicans to the far further to the right. And people are afraid of, of being criticized by people on social media or on the internet. And as a result of that, members of Congress don't really you know, fraternize anymore. And, and therefore I think they don't really know each other that well. Um, I have hosted dinners for members of Congress and they like them because they're allowed to, to talk to people from the opposite party because there's no press there. Nobody will talk about it because everything is, is held quietly there. And the third factor I think is that there's just a, uh, a sense in the country that um, the white majority that predominated in this country, when, when, when John Kennedy was elected president in 1960, 90% of the population in this country was white, 90%. Obviously not the case now, that it, it's changed. And as the white population goes down in percentage, many people who are white feel that they are uh, having some of their privileges, their rights, their economic livelihood taken away by those who are minorities. 
And as a result of that, there is a very large feeling in certain parts of the country and among certain parts of the population that we have to do some things to thwart the effort to let people to vote or to let people recognize their ability to, to rise to their, to their highest level of, of, of competency. And as a result, the country is really divided. And the Congress of the United States reflects that. You have a 51-50 uh, uh, situation in the Senate and basically almost divided in the House. And I suspect most people in Washington believe that after the midterm elections, the Senate and the House will be Republicans. Obviously, Democrats won't say that, and maybe some don't believe it. But I would say that so-called smart money in Washington thinks that since normally in the first time, in the first midterm election after a president's elected, he loses seats in the House and Senate. People think that probably will happen now. So we, while we're divided now, just imagine what it's going to be like with uh, President Biden and a, and a Republican Congress. I think we're not going to get very much accomplished, sadly. David, we talked about the 13 genes that you define in the introduction and, and carry forth in the book. We obviously don't have time to talk about all of them, but two of them struck me as interesting choices, and I'd just like to have you comment on those. Now, you're the chairman of the Kennedy Center. You are incredibly philanthropic and charitable, particularly in the culture world. And you pick as one of the 13 genes of the American politic, the American citizenship, the American people, culture. Tell us why you yes. pick culture as one of the 13. Every country has its own culture, but our culture is fairly unique because it's an amalgam of so many different cultures. When this country was set up, uh, it was mostly a Western European culture, a British culture to some extent. But as we brought more people into the country, and not always did they come in so easily, we've uh, restrained uh, uh, people from coming in. The country initially, when it was set up, anybody could come into the country. No passports, no visas. Later, when people from outside Western Europe are coming, we set up some constraints. When people coming in from Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, people were Jewish, people were Asian, we began to have some constraints on who could come in. And, and the result is, um, you know, we've had some real challenges on immigration. But ultimately, many people have come in this country and created a culture, which is a uniquely American culture. It used to be that the art world really centered in Europe. Now the art world really centers in the United States. It used to be that, that music um, might have centered in other parts of the world. Now it's really centered here. The great creativity of the United States really can't be, I think, matched by any other place in the world. So the world looks to America for culture. It's a different type of culture than Europe or Asia, but it's a unique American culture and it kind of binds us together. We have many things that we, we, we believe in common in our culture, but the culture is an amalgam of many, many forces from many different parts of the world that come together to create something unique in America. One, one example is, is jazz. Jazz is essentially invented in the United States, came out of the black culture, black music culture in New Orleans, went to Chicago, New York, and other places, but it's very unique, distinctly American. And there are many other things like that are distinctly American that make up part of our culture. The other one that I found interesting was number 13, which you call the American dream. Why pick that one? The American dream phrase was invented uh, in 1936, but it's listed for, it's been around for quite a long time. The American dream really means people believe in this country that you can rise from the bottom and, and get to the top of society. I believe in the American dream. I came from very modest circumstances, and I believe, rightly or wrongly, that you could rise to the top if you worked hard and got lucky and so forth. Ironically, ironically, the American dream is now believed more by the people that come to this country as immigrants than people that are born here. So to some extent, we've lost the sense among some of our people, particularly from those from low, lower economic and social stratus, that they can rise up. Many people think uh, if you're an African-American, you might not be able to rise up because of discrimination. But yet people come to this country thinking that they can rise up here. We have 46 million immigrants in this country, 46 million and 40 million more who are the children of immigrants. No other country has that many immigrants. And these people came here because they thought they could rise up in large part because of the American dream. I believed in it. And Bob, you believed in it as well. David, um, I learned a lot from this book. Uh, and some of the things we'll talk about tonight are things that struck me as interesting. In the interview with Danielle Allen of Harvard about the Declaration of Independence, you note that it doesn't say the Declaration of Independence. And you ask her, where does the Declaration of Independence come from? Uh, tell us about that. Well, the declaration was really written in, uh, Thomas Jefferson was part of a five person committee to explain why we were going to break away from England. There was to be a vote on July the 2nd of breaking away from England, that vote occurred. Then the next two days, July the 3rd and July the 4th, 
the uh, delegates basically to the uh, to the Continental Congress, Second Continental Congress, voted on the language that Thomas Jefferson had largely written by himself. There were four other people in the committee. Uh, he had 17 days to write it. He not like most people. He took the end. He took it. Did it in three days. He largely wrote from some other things, and today we would call some of it plagiarism, but maybe that's unfair. He took some other things from, from other people. He borrowed them, what you might say. But he wrote a sentence in the Declaration of Independence that is the most famous sentence in the English language. It is, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that, they, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Why is that so famous? At the time that they were debating this on July the 4th, it wasn't that famous because people weren't paying attention to the preamble. They're only paying attention to the sins of King George that were listed in later in the declaration. But later this became the creed of our country. And Thomas Jefferson wasn't happy with the editing that was done at the Continental Congress. In fact, for eight or nine years after the, the declaration was adopted, he refused to acknowledge he had written it because he was not happy with the way that it had been edited. Later he realized it was probably worth his saying he had edited it, edited it, and written it, and in his uh, epitaph, he said the first thing he wanted on his tombstone was author of the Declaration of Independence, and that is done uh, that way. I would say that uh, the Declaration is called the Declaration of Independence because a printer put it on. Uh, it wasn't called that. It was a printer that put it on. And one other point I would make is that Thomas Jefferson and John Adams fought for 50 years over many subjects after the Declaration was adopted. John Adams always thought that the vote to be independent on July the 2nd was the key thing that happened. And he wrote to his wife, Abigail, and said, for, for the rest of time in history, we will remember July the 2nd and celebrate this with fireworks. Why do we celebrate July the 4th? Because a year later, on July the 2nd, 1777, the delegates of the Continental Congress forgot it was July the 2nd, and they didn't plan, plan a party or anything. So the time they got it organized, they organized it on July the 4th. And so we celebrate July the 4th to some extent, and that's one of the reasons why those two men, one of the reasons they fought. Interestingly, both of these men died exactly within one hour of each other on July the 4th, 50 years later, 1826. Many people thought that was a sign of providence, that something was really uh, miraculous about the Declaration of Independence. Danielle Allen also notes, if I've got it right, David, that it wasn't originally life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. It was originally life, liberty, and property, right? That's right. Yes, um, the life, liberty, and property was something that had been written earlier by George Mason, in a document in Virginia, uh, but Thomas Jefferson changed it to pursuit of happiness. But to be honest, happiness had, had, wasn't meaning people smiling all the time. It was an equivalent for property. It's another way of talking about property or possessions. So it, it was stated differently, and we've used the word happiness a little bit differently than they did then, but it really meant essentially all your possessions, your, your pursuit of possessions or your property. You also have a fascinating interview with Catherine Brekus of Harvard. I must note, David, there are a lot of Harvard people in this book. We should have a few more Chicago people, but that's um, a different it, it, discussion. It is, it's, it's a challenge, yes. I am a member yeah, of Harvard know. Corporation. Maybe I'm uh, biased. I, I, but, know, uh, I know. Uh, Catherine Brekus's interview is about religious freedom, and you have an interesting exchange with her about why people came to this country. And she says, it's one of the biggest myths of American history and American religious history that the Puritans came here to create a new world of religious freedom. They came here because they wanted religious freedom for themselves, but once they got to Massachusetts Bay, they persecuted people and everybody else's religious faiths. Talk about that irony. It's true. Um, people left England because they wanted to pray the way they wanted to pray, very nice, but when they got over here, they didn't want anybody else to pray it the way uh, they weren't praying. So if you were, for example, Roger Williams was kicked out of the Massachusetts colony, had to go found R Rhode Island because he wasn't allowed to uh, exercise his religion. Uh, people who are Catholic were not allowed to exercise their re religion. And a whole state was created in Maryland uh, so that people who are Catholic could have a place that they could observe uh, their religion. So it's an interesting myth that, that we really have religious tolerance. Now, fortunately, by the time we got to the Constitution, and the First Amendment was drafted by James Madison and ratified by the rest of the country, it does say that, that the, the government shall not uh, embrace any religion or prohibit people from praying the way they want. But that was not the way the country was originally set up. It was not until later that we actually adopted that principle. In your interview with the great historian and our good friend Michael Beschloss about, the, about presidential elections, he talks about Richard Nixon, 
who repeatedly told friends, quote, the election was stolen from me. I was the person who was elected president. He also talks about the fact that it fell to Nixon to actually preside over the Senate certification of his own loss. He talks further about Al Gore, uh, the famous Bush v. Gore decision from the Supreme Court. And Gore in his speech said, for the sake of our democracy, I offer my concession. And he contrasts that with what happened this time. Uh, both Nixon and Gore had reason right. to complain and, and reasons to argue, but for the good of the country, they did otherwise. And Beschloss in this interview explains that. Tell us why it's important that it should be done that way versus the way it was done this time. Well, Richard Nixon uh, honestly believed that the election had been stolen from him. Uh, famously, Mayor Richard Daley called John Kennedy in the United election and said, well, with the help of a few friends, we're gonna win this state. And nobody knew exactly what he meant. But it seemed as if uh, there was uh, some chicanery. And never, in any event, Nixon was convinced that, that there was fraud there. However, um, President Eisenhower and President, former President Hoover uh, convinced him that it would be unseemly, un, in, uh, harmful to the country to file litigation and protest. So he quietly basically conceded. Um, with Al Gore, that election, uh, you know, post-election effort went on for about a month. But it went up to the Supreme Court. And very interestingly, the Supreme Court ruled in Bush v. Gore five to four, not unanimously, five to four that, in effect, President Bush had been elected. And so Al Gore didn't say, wait a second, only one vote majority and I'm not president. And it's only 530 votes in Florida anyway. I'm going to contest everything. He didn't do that. He said, for the sake of the country, I, I concede the election. Um, it's a sad situation that we didn't fi find the same situation uh, most recently. Um, I would say there probably was some fraud in 1960, and there may well have been some fraud in, in, 19, in, in 2000, but there doesn't seem to be any fraud of any consequence in, in the most recent election. So it's a sad situation that we had to go put ourselves through this, and trying to explain this to young school children is not easy, uh, why we've been through this uh, terrible post-election period of time. But in, in any event, um, I do admire Richard Nixon for giving up. And I certainly admire for, for Al Gore for not contesting that election, which any, almost anybody else would have said, I'm going to contest that election more than he did. In your interview with Philip Deloria, again, Harvard, David, uh, about Native Americans, you talk about the uh, amazing parallels with the sad pandemic that we're going through now. It was written up today in the papers, I think, that one out of 500 Americans has, have died of the virus. Um, and I didn't realize till I read this and in the interview with Mr. Deloria, and he tells us one of the things that Europeans brought was epidemic disease, which killed off many native people. From 70 to 90% of the people were killed off by disease in some areas. It's interesting in history for us to think about when we're contemplating our own contemporary world, so vulnerable to pandemics. Uh, it was amazing to me to learn the devastation. And he tells us that the Native American population went from 100 million to the order of 7.5 million. That's devastating. And I thought there was a, a sad yes. parallel to what we're well. seeing. Before, you know, the myth we all grew up when we were younger was that uh, the well-educated, very talented uh, English settlers came over here and hoped to civilize, civilize the Indians. Well, the truth is the Native Americans were living in a quite civilized way well before the Westerners showed up here. There were a staggering number of people, some people say somewhere as many as 100 million people who were in the North American and South American continents at one point uh, in history. But then when, when the Westerners came over, uh, they had certain diseases that they would spread and there was no immunity because the Indians had never been exposed to that before. And they didn't know about masking. They didn't have vaccines, obviously. And so that was the way that so many of them were killed off. And today, uh, it's hard to believe, but there are only about 5 million Native Americans or people of Native American ancestry left in the country. And that's in part because there was some, some obviously some, some fighting that went on and, and we, we weren't really good at honoring our agreements. 
uh, the, the uh, interview with him goes through the fact that we had so many agreements with Indians and that we never would honor them. Then the result was we kept pushing them further and further west. And even when we gave them their own uh, territory, Oklahoma, we took that back as well. So sad commentary on how we treated Native Americans in this country. And, uh, you know, until you read this, you really don't understand exactly how unfortunate uh, the treatment was uh, of our Native American population. Your interview with Drew Gilpin Faust about the Civil War, you draw another very contemporary, contemporarily relevant parallel. And so much in this book is, is while it's about history, really relevant. Uh, he said, dealing with large scale deaths in the US has occurred twice since the Civil War, during the great influenza of 1918, 1919, and during the current pandemic. In both cases, though spaced by a century, the US healthcare system, far more modern than it was in the 1860s, has struggled to deal with the human toll. So maybe we haven't come all that far, given, given that point. Well, think about this. Um, in, the, in, the, in the influenza of 1918, which was called the Spanish influenza, and there was nothing to do with uh, Spain. It didn't come from Spain. The reason it was called the Spanish influenza is that in those days, there was embargoes by the press on reporting about the, this um, uh, disease. And the only place there really wasn't an embargo was in Spain. So Spain reported it. So people all of a sudden call it the Spanish flu. It wasn't the Spanish flu. Um, we, we lost an enormous amount of Americans, much more than we've lost this time. The estimates vary, but it, it's estimated that 100 million people around the world died from this. And maybe as many as 30 million Americans died from this. Nobody really knows for certain. But because there, nobody was allowed to talk about it, it was embargoed. In fact, President Wilson, who probably got the virus and may have been really uh, almost died from it, uh, he wouldn't allow people to talk about it. And he never once mentioned it himself. Never once did he mention anything. There was no public statements by the president of that influenza. And interestingly, the doctors that did exist then, there was, there was no vaccine that was ever developed. They still do not have a vaccine for whatever that flu was. But that, that, that period of time, people were told to do three things, socially distance, wash your hands, and wear a mask. So 100 years later, what are we told? You know, the same thing. So we haven't advanced as much as we like. Fortunately, we have a vaccine for this particular type of, uh, of uh, pandemic, but we didn't have one then. And that's one of the reasons why so many people died. One of the most fascinating interviews in this book was with Ken Burns about the Vietnam War. And you have a long discussion with Ken Burns about losing wars. Um, he, you talk about, this is your introduction, the Revolutionary War, Spanish-American War, World War I and II, provided most Americans with a certain sense of power. It was not omnipotence. We're, we've never lost a war. The War of 1812, despite the British destruction of federal buildings in the Korean War, were not seen somehow as losses. And Ken Burns says in your interview with him, US governments, both Democratic and Republican administrations throughout a war that lasted more than 15 years and resulted in deaths of more than 52,000 soldiers, this is the Vietnam War, knew such a war would not really be won militarily. And these administrations saw the war as really a domestic political undertaking. Ken Burns says, quote, Vietnam explains a lot about who we were, not only then, but now. Do you think the events of Afghanistan over the last 20 years, and particularly the last three, four months, will be a defining moment in our history of war? It's hard to tell. I would say on Vietnam, and I interviewed him about his Vietnam War series, 10-part series some of you may have seen on TV. What Ken Burns was so upset with is the documents he discovered that said, we knew, the presidents of the United States knew we could not win that war militarily. It was a question of whether we could win it politically. And in the end, 50, more than 58,000 uh, American soldiers died in that war, and hundreds of thousands of uh, civilians obviously died in that war. Millions of other uh, people died in that war from North Vietnam and South Vietnam. It's a sad, sad situation. Uh, but we knew at the time that we couldn't win militarily, but people were afraid of telling the American people that. And Afghanistan is a little bit different situation. We didn't have protests in the street about Afghanistan. Why not? Because we don't have a draft. We had a draft. Bob, you and I lived through the draft period of time. And obviously, many people didn't want to go fight the war in Vietnam. There were draft protests. There were lots of war protests. 
in 20 years in fighting in Afghanistan. I can't recall really any major march on Washington to get out of Afghanistan. That's in part because we we have uh, an army that's not that's that's not really a drafted army to some extent. Um, I don't know what the impact of Afghanistan is going to be, but clearly around the world, American um, the American government isn't seen now as reliable as a partner as it was seen many many years ago. And while the Afghanistan could have been handled better, um, I, I think the president is uh, was probably right to get out of Afghanistan after 20 years. But probably we could have handled the, the exit better than than it was handled. In your interview with uh, the great John Meacham, another friend, about John Lewis, the amazing John Lewis, uh, he makes, uh, Meacham makes the point, you and I know a lot of folks who had exemplary early careers who tended to take care of themselves as life went on. They started out doing good and they ended up doing well. John Lewis didn't do that. He stayed in the fight. He stayed in the arena. And I wanted to write my book to explore what the roots of that had been. Let me ask you a very personal question, David. You have stayed in the game. You've got all the money you need and houses and everything else. What has caused you, like John Lewis, to stay in the game? Well, I wouldn't compare myself with John Lewis, uh, but I would say that, um, look, I came from very modest circumstances. I got lucky in my business career and I'm basically giving away my money. I, I signed the giving pledge and I just want to give back to the country that made it possible for, for me with you know, uh, parents who didn't have college or high school degrees to, uh, to rise up. So that's what makes me do it. And I, 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 I enjoy what I'm doing. What is life about but the pursuit of happiness to some extent? And I'm happiest when I'm, you know, talking about the country and trying to give back to the country. So just as you are doing in many ways. So um, that's what drives me uh, more than anything else. Um, it's not material possessions. The um, interview that you did with uh, Boo, Srinivasan, I hope I'm pronouncing right. that right, David. Um, you talk about you know, inventions and he lists four inventions as the most important kind of foundation of, of American commerce and capitalism and, uh, and four people who he strike him as the, the critical, if you will, inventors. Eli Whitney, Samuel Morse, Henry Ford, and Andrew Carnegie. Who would you add to that list, David, uh, of great inventors who fundamentally changed our okay. country and our culture? Well, I would just say this person, for those who don't know him, is an Indian immigrant who basically made some money and he decided to write a history of American capitalism over 400 years. And, uh, and his point really is that American capitalism is so unique and it's really one of the things that made this country strong. And I think while the word capitalism is not in the Declaration of Independence and not in the Constitution, our capitalist system has given us an enormous amount of wealth. It has some problems for sure, but enormous amount of wealth. And I would say uh, most particularly in recent years, we've seen people that have invented things that have transformed the way we live. So Steve Jobs and the personal computer, um, Mark Zuckerberg and, and social media, uh, Bill Gates and, and all kinds of software, um, and and Amazon, Jeff Bezos, with what he's done with Amazon. Just think of those four people. The com com how many of you can uh, get by it every day or any day without using Google? I should have mentioned Google as well. How many of you can get by a day without using Google, a smartphone, a computer, or using buying something from Amazon or something from Apple? Very few. Our lives are dependent on these entrepreneurs who built these great companies, which are now dominant, not only in the United States, but around the world. And I don't use the word dominant in a antitrust sense, but very, very large. So I admire the people that have, have come in more recent years to kind of take advantage of the entrepreneurial spirit in this country and invent things. And that's what makes this country still strong. People believe you can build a company here. You can create great wealth for yourself, which ultimately you're going to wind up giving away and then ultimately help people's lives become better. David McCullough's interview, which was focused, you could talk to him about a hundred things, but you spent your time with him about the Wright brothers. And yes. in your introduction to that uh, interview, you write about something that I so firmly believe in. And, and you say, David McCulloch suggests that this informal liberal arts education that the brothers gave themselves in both their youth and their adulthood 
produce man flight as much as did their self-taught engineering and mechanical skills. And McCullough agrees. And he says, these brothers who cracked one of the most impossible technical mysteries of all times had a liberal arts education. Whenever I speak to young people, right. I preach a liberal arts education. Give us your reflections on that. Well, think about this. Man has been trying for thousands of years to fly. There are lots of people, experiments to do it. Nobody could get anywhere. And that two people not trained in science, no aeronautical engineering background, no engineering background, no college degrees. They go to Kitty Hawk and with spending less than $1,000, they show that man can fly and can land safely. But even in, despite that, they, they had to convince people in the United States of it for it took a while. They had to go to France to convince people there that it was good. And then they came back to the United States. It was here later that we were convinced that it was going to work. But the point in, that you just made is this. They had, they had grown up in a household with a lot of books and they read those books. They didn't go to college, but they read those books. And those books were lots of books on social sciences, things like that. And it's David McCullough's view that the in, interest and the curiosity you get from a social sciences background led them to keep asking questions and keep perfecting their, their flying skills. And that's what he attributes uh, their success to when other people were trying to develop flying and really couldn't do it. In your interview with Wynton Marcellus, uh, which was fascinating about jazz, a theme comes through that's not devoted to jazz, but I think a lot of these people you interviewed would agree with. He goes on in a very candid way about his feeling about the, let's say, unfairness, let's say, incompetence of the press. He says, I would say I've been treated unfairly by newspapers like the New York Times. The way jazz at Lincoln Center has been covered is abominable. Even though we get articles, those articles are always poorly researched. The depth of engagement with the form should be required to qualify you to speak of it in the paper of record. But because it's jazz, it doesn't matter to people. Talk about how these people feel about their public personas, their coverage, the way they're characterized, because I know a lot of them, you know them all. And I know that feeling expressed very vividly by when Marsalis is shared. Well, Wynn Marsalis is from a famous family in jazz. Sadly, his father passed away because of COVID during the, the COVID period of time that we've been through. Uh, Wynn Marsalis really um, has given his whole life to jazz. He was actually a classical musician as well, and he's won awards in that as well as uh, Grammy Awards in that as well as in jazz. But he's devoted his life now to educating, to composing, and performing. And he really is responsible for uh, jazz at Lincoln Center. But his view is that jazz, maybe because it's considered to be from part of the African-American community hasn't really gotten the attention in the white community as being the kind of a proper um, music form. In other words, it doesn't get the attention of classical music or more popular folk music or a popular kind of uh, a rock and roll music. And therefore he thinks that it's unfair, maybe racist, that people haven't given jazz performers and jazz musicians the same credit uh, for being really m musically talented. But that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to um, let people know more about why jazz is so important. And to him, his view is rather than be upset about this, he's not going to just basically run around and just complain about it. I asked him the questions about it, but he basically tries to educate people about it and give his point of view. But I would say, well, if he's upset about it, he doesn't let people see it day to day. He just goes about his business and tries to educate people about what he regards as the wonders of jazz. You interview the great Rita Moreno about acting and the actor's life, I love the interview. And she makes a point that I found interesting. She says, here's the thing. I know a lot of people who did all of these things and haven't gotten as fortunate as I. I know a lot of people who deserve all of the attention in the world, all kinds of honors, and don't have them. I really think at a certain point, it's in the lap of the gods. I really do. How much of the success, David, of these people you interviewed is luck, how much is hard work? Well, I think you make your luck by working hard. In other words, if you put in this time and you, and you develop a skill set, you know, at some point somebody will notice it. Maybe if you go someplace, somebody might be introduced to you who might help you. You make your own luck. But clearly there's a lucky breaks along the way. In Rita Moreno's case, 
you know, she was discovered at the last minute for, for by, by a famous producer. She got into movies, uh, ultimately developed an incredible career where she won an Emmy, a, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony, and also a Presidential Medal of Freedom. And the interesting thing about, the, about her is she's very frank in this book. She's now living an incredible life, 88 years old and still performing. But she lived for many years with, with Marlon Brando and tried to commit suicide because of his infidelities and basically put a lot of uh, things in her stomach that should have killed her. She was found by a, a, a house person and, and, and basically a housekeeper, and they had her stomach pumped out. Had that not happened, she would have died many, many years ago. It's an incredible story of a Puerto Rican woman who came here, was never really taken seriously as an actress or performer for many, many years. Now, of course, we all know her and for what she's done. But there's no doubt that luck is something that, you know, you have to create. You just can't sit in your room all the time and expect luck is going to happen. You have to develop the skill set and eventually some luck will come your way, I believe. Can I jump in and say, Robert, we have time for one more question. And okay, then one more question. Two more and then I'll stop. We'll go back to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, David, Cal Ripken, you interview about baseball. And I love many of the questions you asked, but one of my favorites was, so you had the 2,131 games, you break the record, everybody's happy, most emotional moment of your life. Why not just say, I'm done. I broke the record. I can sit it out tomorrow. Tell us what he said in response to that. Well, for one thing, he didn't want to be fined only by breaking Lou Gehrig's record of 2,130 games. And he wants to say that he had a job to do, which is to help his team and, and to keep playing. And he enjoyed what he was doing. So he didn't want his life to be just about breaking Lou Gehrig's record. He wanted his life to be about other things. And I would say that Cal Ripken is one of the rare role models in the baseball world these days where you can find no scandals. In other words, there's no drugs. There's no uh, substance enhancement. He was a very modest person. Um, he basically gave everything he had to the Baltimore Orioles, the only team he played with. And he's now teaching young people how to play baseball. A real role model, I think, in many ways. And I, I, a very emotional time was after he finally decided to step down and stop playing after 2,600 uh, games or so, 17 years without uh, missing a game. He just told his manager one day, I'm not going to go out today. He could have played more, but he decided it was time. And so when the New York Yankees, the opposing team, saw that he wasn't coming out for the first time in 17 years, they went out on the field and gave him a standing ovation and everybody else did because they realized he decided to, to on his own, step down from the, from the streak. And his explanation and description of all that in the book is just wonderful. Final question, Justice Sotomayor. She, uh, in a, again, a very interesting interview, says, quote, you do not have to be a political figure to make a contribution. You just have to be a person who cares. Now, someone like you who does incredible things for this country, for our city, and you have the money to do it and you have the commitment to do it. But how can the ordinary person give back and contribute? And with that, I'll turn it back to audience questions. Okay. Well, I'll put it this way. When de Tocqueville came here in the 1830s to write about America, he said it was hard to get interviews with people because everybody was volunteering. And I like to remind people that is the most precious thing you can do, which is give your time. You can always make more money if you want to make more money. You can't make more time. So I tell people that you should give your time, volunteer, find a cause that you care about. If you want to give money, fine, but give your time as well. That's your most valuable commodity. And what she's talking about in that interview is the importance of citizens pitching in and being good citizens, because she's very concerned that citizens have lost the sense of what it means to be an American citizen. We don't know much about our history, history and civics, and she's educating people about that. But she's saying, pitch in, become a good citizen, and really live up to the dreams that our forefathers had for what Americans were going to do. Participate in the democracy. David, thank you. I'm going to turn it back to our moderator. Thank you, David, and thank you, Robert. And I want to say, David, I love that last message because I think we can all um, contribute with our time and our passion, which is great. Uh, we do have some great questions from some of our attendees. So I'd love to take a few minutes and just um, serve them up to you. Uh, somebody asked, do you think, David, that we are on a path for a second civil war? And if so, why? I don't think we're going to have a military civil war of the type we had before. Um, I think the tensions were uh, much more complicated then. But remember, we had something that divided us in a way that nothing quite divides us today. We had slavery. 
Slavery was the original sin of this country. It was our birth defect. Well, we have lots of challenges now. We don't have anything that's tearing the country apart quite the way that slavery did. And so therefore, I don't think we're going to have a military confrontation between the states. And I do think that nobody is planning to secede and so forth. So I don't think we'll have a second civil war. But I do think we've got a long way to go before we can get back to uh, you know, more civility in our government and more uh, cooperation, more bipartisanship. And I hope it's not a tragedy that makes us come together because we know, we saw after 9-11, we came together, but that was a tragedy. What we want to do is find some non-tragic way to bring us together. That's a uh, good, good words. Um, James asks, what role does the current U.S. Supreme Court play in our American experiment? It's a very interesting- and, and By the way, the guy asking that question is one of our classmates, but I won't okay. expose him. I interviewed Justice uh, Breyer just a couple of nights ago at the 92nd Street Y in New York, and I asked him those kind of questions. And I would say the answer I would give and the answer he would give is that the court wasn't intended by the Constitution and the founders to be quite as powerful as it became. But because the court really articulates its reasons, does so in, I think, in a, a, a very thoughtful way, the court has taken on the, 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 the role of really uh, helping to run the government in more ways than anybody thought. When we have difficult issues like abortion or voting rights or things like the Affordable Care Act, whether it works or not, uh, we tend to resolve them by going to the court. And interestingly, in this country, we tend to listen to the court, even the court in, in the famous Bush v. Gore, five to four, but other things, five to four decisions, we listen to the court. So I think that the court is, uh, it plays a unique role in America. There's no other country in the world that has a court quite like ours where the court has that much power. And I am amazed at the, at the, um, the seriousness of these uh, justices that they've taken, and they tend to be apolitical themselves, and they claim that they never talk about politics, and maybe they don't, but I, I'm saddened that the court has become so political. In the old days, uh, a justice who was nominated for the Supreme Court never had a confirmation hearing. They would have a vote and get on relatively easily. Now we have these uh, confirmation hearings that are really circuses, unfortunately. Yes, that is true. Okay, here's another question. I love this one from Bill, who asks, of the 13 genes that you wrote about, which one do you think is in the greatest jeopardy moving forward? Well, moving forward, I think the biggest, the biggest one probably right now is the concept of voting rights. I do think that we believe in uh, voting. It's been an important part of our country's history. And right now we have challenges to the fact that we're, we're supposed to vote. We, the theory about voting is the more people that vote, the better off the country should be. And, and now we have a situation where many people leave, the fewer people vote, the better off we're gonna be. So you can't say that, for example, in, in Texas, in Harris County, which is all of Houston, that there can be only one place to drop off your, uh, your write-in ballot. I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously not gonna be very productive for people to try to get to that one place. So we're really trying to restrict voting and really, in many ways, I think it's as un-American as anything I've seen in recent years. And I'm amazed that the effort to stop this has been thwarted a bit. And I, I think for the time being right now, the efforts in Texas and Georgia and Florida seem to be working. All right, thanks. Um, and finally, Laura asks, is there anyone that you wish you could have interviewed who's not currently living, uh, or so who is currently living, that you, that you couldn't have? Well, uh, the, con the, the interview concept is a relatively new ph phenomenon. It probably started in the late night talk shows when, as a form of entertainment with Jack Parr and Steve Allen and so forth. Uh, but 100 years ago, there were no interviews of people. There are no interviews of Abraham Lincoln. There are no interviews of George Washington, uh, William Shakespeare, Cleopatra, Henry VIII. So I would love to ask William Shakespeare, who really wrote those plays? No one person could have done all that, right? Or Henry VIII, why didn't you get a prenuptial agreement with your wife as opposed to chopping off their heads? Or Cleopatra, who was a better lover, um, uh, Mark Antony or Julius Caesar? These are the things that people want to know. I wish there was a way to do it. And I've thought about writing a book where I would get experts who know uh, these famous people who lived a long, long time ago and have them play in character uh, Abraham Lincoln. I could interview Abraham Lincoln or George Washington. And I'm uh, working on whether that, that can work or not. But anyway, I would love to have interviewed any of those people, but the most prominent American who's ever lived, the greatest American who's ever lived is Abraham Lincoln, in my view, and he is the one person I would love to interview more than anybody else. David, you know who I want you to interview? Who? Queen Elizabeth. Oh. That's the one I want to see. She doesn't do any interviews, but if anybody no. can convince Queen Elizabeth to write a book, it's Bob Barnett. 
I'm going to try. <laughs> I, I give it my best shot. I want everybody to remember before we go, this is the book. Please buy hey. it. Number eight on the New York Times, number two on Wall Street Journal and Publishers Weekly. David, thank you for doing thank this. Thank you very much, Bob. And thank you, uh, Carolyn. And thank you, uh, Karen. Appreciate it very much. And Thank uh, you all. And thank you to our attendees. And there's links in the uh, chat if you haven't gotten your books yet, uh, because you're going to want them. And there's two pre previous books, too, that, um, David, I was going to ask you quickly. When you started out writing your first, did you envision this was going to be a trilogy? That's the first part. And and I guess the second part is, did you imagine that your third book would would be as it was, given all the turmoil of the last few um, years? The answer is no. Um, I didn't imagine any of this, but uh, I had a good lawyer who advised me on many different things, and he convinced me that I could write a book and a second book and a third book. So if any of you are thinking of writing a book, call Bob Barnett. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you all. We'll, we'll hope to see everyone back on here for another event. Um, don't forget your book. Gift giving season is coming and um, you want to have a piece of this. It's almost as good as having everyone at your at your dining room table. So there you go. Thank you all. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you.